My name is Tracy Rebstock and I'm an archivist at the Washington State Archives. And today I'm going to talk to you a little bit about um, state archives, state government archives, and local government records and how they can be used for genealogical research. We are an office under the Secretary of State Division and we do have some um, sister divisions under the Secretary of State's office that also can help with your research, that being the State Library and our State um, Legacy Project. Um, both of them can help a lot when doing family research. Government archives tend to collect um, records that are created for and by government. So there is definitely uh, a lot of confusion sometimes about, well, what type of records would a government archive even have to help with my family research? And a lot of times you have to think a little bit outside the box. Um, many of you already know that there's birth, death, marriage, and divorce records. Um, some of you know that there's naturalization that can be found here. Many of you go into probate or um, court case records, but I'm, I'm hoping to cover some of those as well as some of the non-traditional records that we may hold. A lot of these records were created by the government for different purposes. It could be for taxes, it could be for um, incarceration, it could be for tracking who lived on what type of property, but there are lots of reasons why the government would have created the record and it's just up to us to be detectives to kind of see what sorts of records we can find. I'm going to give a brief mention to the digital archives. Um, that's available, just do a Google, Google search of Washington State Archives, digital archives, and that will pop up. Many of our records have been digitized and are out there for you to search. Um, but keep in mind, while there's a lot of records on the digital archives, there are a lot of records that um, are still in our collections. And you're, you're kind of seeing some of that behind me. I'm being surrounded. I'm, I'm coming to you live from our second floor stacks, which I thought would be kind of interesting and fun for those of you who like the books, old books. So I'm going to pepper this with some family stories and amongst, and I've changed the names to protect the innocent. <laughs> so um, bear with me as I tell some of these stories. One of my um, favorite stories that I like to tell is um, about uh, four people who came to the U.S. from Switzerland and they first settled in Wisconsin and I was contacted by a researcher about the, these, uh, this brother and sister, Josephine and Emile. And the rest of the family she'd track down to um, all these places within Wisconsin, but then she was like, why did these two, these two siblings end up in Clark County, Washington? So we started with a couple of names and started to look into the record and located our first record, which was a divorce record. And what was interesting about the divorce record initially was it gave some information about the family. And this is from 1895, and it was between Peter and Mary. And what was interesting about it is that Mary is the one who filed for divorce in 1895. And in this divorce decree, or in this divorce case file, they name all of the children. So it could look something like this. And this gave the, um, the name and age of each of the children. Many of you are like, well, I could look for that on a census record, but sometimes in the census record, depending on who was in the house at the time, they may not have gotten a full listing of everyone, or maybe the ages were incorrect. So this is kind of a, a great way to kind of compare and contrast the census record to what else might be out there as another record. So in this one, it lists um, their children, Edward, Ellen, Anna, Mary, and Emil. And that immediately got us thinking about Emile and Josephine because Peter and Mary were their neighbors in Wisconsin and they ended up as neighbors or close by with them when they were down in Clark County, Washington. So both, of, both the researcher and myself were kind of like, wonder why the brother and sister and this couple had moved to the same area. Is there more of a story? So as we dug through the, the records, we found a lot of different things. And so what it turns out that Peter and Mary were indeed married and they were indeed friends with Emile and Josephine. What's interesting to note is that um, Josephine did get married while she was in Clark County and she also divorced her husband um, 
over time, but once her brother passed away, she actually remarried her husband and left all of her property to her husband when she died. His name was Andre. So you can see how using that record can kind of put together a family story in a way that you wouldn't have known. It turns out Peter had actually filed for divorce against his wife prior to, uh, a couple years prior to this, and the court had turned him down because he had alleged that she had been unfaithful. And she um, said that she was actually the person who ran the household, made sure the, the money was coming in, and that she was in charge of all of these different um, pieces. So she was asking for full custody of her children and for all the financial wealth, and she was granted that in 1895. The other record I'm going to briefly talk about is the, the probate record, and I'm sure most of you have, have probably at one point in your, in your life done some research with probate records, and I just thought I would share this one with you in particular. I worked with a couple of researchers, a um, couple of cousins, and they were doing some research on William H. Long in Lewis County, and one of the really interesting records we found in his probate was a list um, of his store and a full accounting of everything that he carried in stock in his store at the time of his death. So there is actually an entire file here that is about yay big with all of the items that were in the store. The other interesting thing was the letterhead um, for the store and some of the really interesting things that are listed in here are um, ladies scarlet vests, um, shirts, rubber uh, coats, um, ladies' hose, um, infant cotton wear, there's um, gloves, um, there's, a, there's doorknobs and nails. Everything was inventoried down to the letter, which was really interesting. So I'm going to move on to a few of our non-traditional records just to see um, if, if I can interest you in doing some research in the government archives. One of them is our timber cruise maps. And these come in a variety of um, shapes and sizes, and they're usually by county. And the reason why they were, they were created was to account for timber that's available in a particular county. But as you can see, they, they type up a lot, of, a lot of other information. And one of the information um, that I find most interesting is when people are looking for homes that their family lived in, a lot of times they can find where their location was if they can't if it if it was around earlier before 1900 or before 1910 a lot of times you will see footprints of those in the timber cruises and in this particular map they they note an abandoned cab cabin to say that it had been abandoned for quite some time when they did the timber cruise and the drawing a fun record is when I work with family and they're looking for their um, maybe their aunt or their grandmother or their great aunt who was a teacher in a county school or in a rural school and this is a, a, a teacher contract file that talks a little bit about each um, teacher the post office box address where they lived the date of their contract when it expired what type of contract it was their salary their date of school commencement and what positions they held, and a little bit of remarks about them at the end. And this has been a very interesting record to help people dig into when they're looking for teachers. I know for myself, my grandmother was a teacher in a rural school, and it's fun to see the log where it shows she got her contract. Personal property rolls. This is a tax roll that was created to note personal property. And this is a rather large book, as you can see. But what's interesting about these is it lists um, it lists different individuals and they have claimed property and that can include things like horses, cattle, sheep, hogs, um, sewing machines, watches and clocks, um, different types of instruments and I helped a researcher look for a family piano to see how old it might have been. There was a lot of information that was missing from it and it was really scarred and there we were trying to find out approximately when we knew the family um, acquired it and we used the personal property taxes to do that. One of my other favorite records is our log and stock brands and this is especially helpful for those who are doing some family research who have um, maybe they had a family farm in their history 
or they still have a family farm in their history. And this, for one particular researcher, we were trying to find what the log brands were, I mean, the log brands for the property, because they had done timber, and then also for the, the cattle that they had, um, what the, the branding would have been. It was a dairy farm. And so this was a very interesting record to show the drawing and when it was filed with the county auditor. So when it comes to school records, not only do we have the teacher contract files, but we also have um, many cases older um, school annuals or yearbooks. So this set of little uh, school annuals is from Lacey here in Washington, and this was called the Rosebud. And within these, you can see um, a listing of the different sports teams they had at the time. They did a class wi will, which has each of the class members um, stating what they're passing off to their underclassmen, which is a great um, listing. They also have their own logos and they talk a little bit about the commencement program uh, when they graduate. You can see they're a lot smaller, but we also have um, full-size color ones that are more modern as well. And for the Olympia High School, we've got those digitized and those are up on our digital archives. Another record that's very interesting is our incarceration files for the state of Washington. And a lot of times people are a little nervous about looking into the, their family's potential criminal past. But a lot of times you can find some really interesting records. And keep in mind, just because someone was listed as a criminal in the record that was done by uh, either the state or the local entity, this, these might not have been crimes that we, that we think about today. Or um, it may have been um, a lot lesser of a crime. But what's really neat about these records is they often have a photograph of the person and a little bit about them or their family. Um, I came across this one in particular. Uh, it was a woman who had been arrested for um, inciting violence, <laughs> inciting, I guess, an insurrection in Seattle. And so this gives a quick little blurb about who she is, what she was doing. Turns out she was a, um, a nurse. And with this record, we were able to go along into the nurse's application records to find out when she became a nurse, when she went to school to be a nurse, and um, when she got her nurse's license. One of the records that we have that's really popular, um, it's gained in popularity, is our professional licensing records. And this particular record is for a dental, um, a dental license that was given to Sarah Broman. And that includes a photograph of her, as well as her um, application for examination. And it gives um, a listing of her certification would be also included in some of these. What's really great about these is this is a place where you can find a photograph of your, um, your relative if you may not have it, or if you want to compare, pho compare photographs. Um, this is what uh, our researcher did is she was trying to see if it was the right Sarah Broman that was her dental um, relative. Um, one last record that I'd like to show you is our trademark record. Um, these trademarks were done by businesses that um, came to the state of Washington. This is from a very early set. The way these are arranged are by um, the picture, actually, instead of the people. But um, within the file, it does talk a little bit about who the people were who um, applied for the trademark and what, what they were um, selling. So I'm going to show a couple of these real quick. One of them is this apple blossom salmon. It's a family business. They would be similar type records, and within the description, they talk a little bit more about what the family did and how the business was run. They may also have a articles of incorporation, which would give um, the, the beneficiaries of the business and who actually established the business. And we've had a couple of researchers come in and use those to tie in. Um, they thought their grandfather was involved in some fam, some land businesses land business and they wanted to see who else he was working with and they had an idea of a guy that they thought was tied to the family but they weren't sure and it turns out the articles incorporation kind of verified who their grandfather was working with and they were able to tie that back together. 
A lot of people ask me how to do research for black, indigenous, or people of color within our government archives. And the question, the, they're not arranged necessarily by race, but they are often um, intermingled amongst the other records that we have. That being said, sometimes depending on the type of um, records that we're collecting, for instance, in the state of Washington, there was a lot of um, records that were created about tribal um, fishing rights in the state of Washington. And so going into those records, you're able to find family members or family ties or people who protested at that time that will have uh, records for those. And then also to realize that some of the records that are created by the government are created by a primarily white government entity. And so uh, finding some of the different records may be meaning to look into some of those places like incarceration or in tax records or in land records to kind of piece those places together. And if you're looking for your relatives of, that are black, indigenous, or people of color, just reach out and contact us and we can help you navigate the different types of records that we have that may be able to show some more about your family history. Um, one of the projects that we've been working on is um, digitizing oral histories that were taken during the bicentennial. And those do include a lot of histories about um, blacks in Seattle in particular, as well as um, some Pacific Islanders in some of our other counties in the southwest corner of the state. So keep an eye out on the digital archives because more information that includes photographs, um, transcripts, and um, indexing for those names are going to be showing up on our digital archives. I know a lot of you are wondering, well, how do we do this research coming into the archives during this time of COVID? And I will say that it varies um, from archive to archive, but our archive has a couple of our branches open uh, with uh, appointment only. So dropping in at this time is probably not the best of ideas, but you can give us a call or shoot us an email if you're in the area and you're interested in doing some research. It's always good to give us a little bit of a heads up, maybe a week before, so that we can kind of talk to you to find out what it is you're looking for. Some of our records are located off site, and that's similar for other archives in the, the greater 50 states as well. We can set up an appointment with you and have you come in and do your research and we can pull records for you. Um, during this time of COVID, we're also working with people to see if it's easily identifiable or something that we can look into fairly, um, fairly easily. If you give us as much information as you have, we may be able to just pull and scan and send that along to you. We do not do in-depth research. Um, there are places you can find where people can do that for you or you can pay for that, that service. But um, for us, uh, we tend to just pull, pull records for people to review or we can go directly to the record. So if you know your person's name and exactly or give a date range maybe a day it can't be a giant date range but usually within like a decade or so we can kind of take a look and see some of our records have indexes we can use and some of them do not so we can kind of work with you to find out what works best for you another question that we get a lot at our archive is how do i leave behind a legacy how do i leave behind my legacy if i'm creating my family stories or compiling my information how do i do that and with a government archive we tend to collect records that were created for the government by the government and we tend to collect records about people who serve in government so if you happen to be someone who served in government or um, or someone who worked with government you served in the legislature or if you were an elected official of some kind definitely talk to your local um, state archive or your local um, government archive and see what's possible. Otherwise, if you contact us, we can often sometimes help you figure out who is the best place for you to um, keep your legacy as you go, whether that can be your alma mater or whether that might be a local historical society in your area. But always feel free to reach out and let us know if you need help with that. If you have any questions or any concerns, please give us an email at research at sos.wa.gov. Thank you.